Great relationships don't just happen. If you want one, you've got to make it yourself. But how do you do that when you didn't have the models and examples that you needed? Some of us were lucky enough to have seen one or two solid marriages growing up. But that's not really enough since what worked for them isn't necessarily going to work for you. And lots of us just started doing marriage and love and relationships the way we thought was expected. Only to find ourselves in a love story that's, I don't know, okay, I guess? There's no right one right way to do love. That's good news. You can let go of all that old baggage and craft a marriage or partnership or chosen family or polycule or whatever that is so much more than okay. It's really the creation of a life that finally feels like home. At least that's what doing this has felt like for me. Me too. And getting here wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for us. We learned the hard way, the very hard way, that love is a verb. And the actions of love don't just come naturally. We all need skills and tools and support to do this well. And that's completely normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, research psychologist and ASECT certified sexuality educator. I'll be sharing personal stories, evidence-based research, and case studies from my work as a relationship coach. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Um, I'm a human doing my best to make relationships my biggest priority in life. We're going to dig deep and offer vulnerable conversations between us as we keep learning how to customize our love and keep growing as individuals. As individuals. As individuals. And as a couple. And as a moresome. It's all very interesting. And we're also going to have some amazing, nuanced conversations with experts who can help you learn more ways to design the life you want. And if you find yourself saying at any point, damn, I really needed to hear that while you're listening, I would love it, we would love it, if you would head over and give us a quick rate and review on iTunes. It really does help other people find us, and we'd be so grateful for that. Now, it's time to reimagine your relationship from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Hey, we're back. We're back. So we're continuing hot guesting summer. We've recorded some great conversations with some amazing people. We want to share them with you. And this week's conversation, I think, is really just, it's a pleasure fest. I think it's fun for everybody or yeah. everybody who wants to have Yeah, everybody who is fun. interested in... Um, intimate, sensual, sexual fun, or interested in self-intimacy, intimacy with oneself. So this, this is for people who are interested in, uh, toys and pleasure and sexual health and pleasure and deepening our intimacy by exploring what's out there to add to the bedroom or wherever. Um, okay. So we're going to talk with... Beth Hanks, and this is going to be a great episode for anybody who's ever been nervous to go into their local sex toy shop. Anybody who's ever been like, you know, I know there's one 40 minutes from here, but yeah, we have, we just haven't gone. Why? I don't know. I don't know what it'll be like. I don't know what it's going to be like. I have a pre, I have an idea of what it is going to be like, and I'm not sure I want that, you know, your own imagination and... Maybe you've gone in yourself, but you've never gone with your partner or Mm, partners. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to do this episode because, Ken, you and I, when we first got together, um, to say you were a neophyte in the toy area would be putting it lightly, I think. Oh, yeah. Like, um, it was something that... Like, you knew didn't, they existed. <laughs> it didn't match my my identity, the one that I kind of, that came out of my, my upbringing and everything. I was like, that's for other people. Right. So I think that's really interesting. And I think it's a great thing to just say out loud because from the outside, you look like a confident, calm, self-assured, um, knowledgeable, and sensual being. But the first time I bought brought my vibrator into our sexual escapades, and they were escapades at the time. They were they escapades. Were ran- yep. Wide ranging yep. all over um, Western Massachusetts <laughs> countryside. <laughs> um it's, you were very excited. You were super supportive. That was the word I was going to use, but also, what's the other word? Um, I wasn't, I didn't know what to do. Like, 
that's great. What happens now? Because I just hadn't engaged in the idea of toys. Right, except we leveraged that. So I think we got really lucky. Or maybe I just had a really particularly smarty pants moment. Um, I knew from the pornography that we had watched together, I knew that we had watched porn together just enough to know that you liked watching people use toys. Right. So I could see yep. that you were excited. I could feel that you were excited. So I did know that that was present. And so I wasn't fearful about bringing toys into our experience. Um, but I also realized that you you just didn't know, you didn't know what words to use around it. That's right. It wasn't so much the actions because you were actually great about moving into action with them. So if I had something and I brought it into the room, great. But you had no idea how to ask for, uh, what else is there? <laughs> yeah, yep. I didn't know how to, I didn't know even know how to form the questions that would have gotten us to the fun. Right. And so this episode is perfect for it is. Yes. the person you were mm -hmm. at that time. Um, or anyone who's in a relationship and they're just not sure how to start incorporating, yeah, trips to a local shop or even shopping online, mm -hmm. but with a knowledgeable hand to like, like how, okay, what might suit our particular needs? Because, I mean, sex toys, they're, they are about pleasure, but they're also about accessibility. Sex toys are about yes. making the acts of pleasure pleasurable for all types of bodies mm -hmm. so if you have mobility issues or you have um specific lubrication issues or anything at all like that it's going to a shop having some guidance the people who work in our local toy shops um and some of our really excellently run indie online shops they're a great help they're, they're, they're there sex for positive a reason. people who are this this is their business. Right. And they this is what they help. love to do. And mm -hmm. Beth in particular, um, she really we really align on what we understand to be um, a primary goal of connection, which is to get to know ourselves right. so that we can connect with others. Right. So that's why I was so excited to have this conversation. And so right before we get into it, I want to address one other issue. Um, we've talked about shame. We've mm -hmm. talked about shame a bunch, yeah. I know, but I don't think we should really open this conversation without addressing. You mentioned feeling a certain way about not, you know, not knowing how to talk yeah. about mm -hmm. toys. There's a reason why. Yeah. And it wasn't that you just didn't have the words. You are an incredibly articulate human with a vocabulary that kicks my ass at Scrabble. <laughs> so say more. But the, uh, but my, I, so I'm sure there's more to it than this, but one of the first things I see is my upbringing involved zero talking about sex, zero talking about pleasure even. And so when, and and sex, it, it I mean, it comes up out of me. I, I feel sexual desire. I respond in sexual ways. I respond to sexual things, but no one would talk about it. So if nobody was talking about this thing and no one wanted to talk about it, it must be bad. So now I take this thing that's just part of me and we, in the silence, build it into a feeling of shame. Mm. And so when I, I, um, I found myself with you, who was perfectly willing and comfortable to talk about and do all these things, it was confusing and... I had to stand there in my shame and watch you stand in the same place without shame and figure out how I communicate with you. Yeah. I'm, I think that you speak to this issue um, in a way that, I, like, I just can't because I... It's not your experience. It's not. So I was raised in a house where, oh my God, there was, there were all kinds of weird, messy stuff, but there, my parents didn't, um, they didn't skip talking about sex. It was pretty normalized. Um, I didn't get any good sex education, but, but talking about sex was normal. Like it, it could be spoken about. It was joked about. I, there, there's the thing, the primary okay. tool mm -hmm. of talking about it was humor. So there was a lot of misinformation, but, um, the other thing about me is that I have a tendency to take things that most people find, um, somehow to be untalkaboutable. And I, 
I feel the flip of that. So mm -hmm. money, sex, religion, all that stuff, I tend to want to lean in. And so it was normal for me when I noticed people feeling um, a tendency not to talk about this stuff, just, just to do it anyways. And that wasn't normal for you. That like no, your not at all. natural mm -hmm. response and what you were trained yep. to do was to not ask questions. And you were literally yeah. trained not to ask questions. I was. I was explicitly trained not to ask questions to avoid my curiosity. When did that start? Uh, I was a little kid. I remember being five. I think it was right right before I started going to school. That's a rough lesson. I didn't <laughs> like it. <laughs> I did not enjoy that feeling of having my curiosity put into a bucket of things that were just annoying. Annoying. There. So that is the pervasive emotion that I remember feeling from you when... I would, I would then <laughs> flip it around and I would ask you a bunch of questions and I would feel like you were annoyed, right? And I was trained that it was an annoying thing, right? even though I had all the questions too. Right. It so, didn't actually take yeah. you that long to break that, that habit. It did take some getting real explicit. I had to get really explicit about, You had to get real explicit hey, because, yeah. It feels like I'm annoying you by asking you these questions, but what I want is for this to be more fun. What I want is for us to have... And I didn't have all of the pleasure-centric language I have now, but I would say things like, I want this to be fun. I want this to be good for both right. of us. Yeah. And I want to bring in um, not just objects, but toys and tools yeah. that would be additive for both of us. And I believed you. I believed that you wanted it to be fun, that this was actually intended to, to grow our sexual experience and our relationship. And I had to believe it past the shame messages that told me that that couldn't possibly be true. Oh, and I had to be careful because it was so easy for me to accidentally reinforce the shame. Well, because it was so pervasive, it was well, easy to touch. But also because I was trained that you lighten the mood by making a joke. Hmm. This just happened to us this morning. I was going to talk about that too. Yeah, it just happened. I, I was trained that when you have to like help somebody reprogram something that's not working, <laughs> like you when you have to... Um, reformat something that's going on yeah you, you make a light of it you make a funny joke you like oh that's funny so this morning i said something about well hey uh, you know you're not much of a hunter i would have thought you'd be a better gatherer i wanted him to select more um perfect produce yeah what do you the, the produce shot the section? plums went bad real fast that's all but so but yeah that, that joke happened. didn't land and it did even though i so value humor in all situations as a supportive way of keeping people related but there you you tried to make it funny and in me i i don't know i can't i still don't know exactly what i wanted in that situation yeah but i felt you receiving it i i started getting the messages like oh this isn't going well and so i relied on the one tool that i think um has been most beneficial to us as we really level up so we've been we've been doing good relational building for many years and this one um, the past year or so, I think, has been our primary level up. It's having a meta conversation yeah. about the conversation we're having. So we'll just say, like, hang on. I hear the conversation we're having kind of going off track or one or, one or both of us is having a reaction. Can we talk about how we're talking about this? And so mm -hmm. we, we stopped talking about the produce or we stopped talking about the vibrator and for a second talk about how we want to talk about it. And so the tool of a meta conversation has really helped us step into a whole new realm where we can talk about stuff that we couldn't talk about before. Yes. Yeah, and I'm great so grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And okay, so without further ado, um, let me introduce Beth Hanks. Beth Hanks is the founder and CEO of Earth and Salt and a sex education certificate student at the Institute for Sexuality, Education and Enlightenment, where I also received my training and where I teach now. Um, she has a BA in art history and studio art from Mount Holyoke and a master's in museum studies. So this store, let me just tell you, is pretty. Um, her master's is from Harvard Extension School. So after concurrent years of identifying sexual self-repression and questioning her sexual desires and health issues, Beth was inspired to open Earth and Salt. And Earth and Salt is a place where she can put into real life, um, her values, her goals of normalizing sex and pleasure, 
providing vital sex education to all, and to be a champion to other business owners and sexuality professionals, especially those from historically marginalized groups. Cannot wait for you to listen to this conversation. Enjoy. It's a great conversation. Welcome to the show, Beth. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Yes, thank you so much for having me. So excited. I, yeah, I was thrilled. I, I was just so excited to have this conversation because, you know, Ken and I talk about sex all the time and we talk about it publicly. We talk about it on the show, but also in a million other settings. Um, and I know you talk about sex all over the place. Yes. Um, not everybody does. And you have a specialty that I am so excited to share with our audience. So just go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm Beth Hankis. My pronouns are she, her. I own Earth and Salt, which is a pleasure-centered adult store in Burlington, Vermont. Um, I say pleasure-centered because I want to make sure that we're sort of understanding the holistic nature that I'm trying to reach. You know, it's, it's about sex, but it's about many other things, relationships, touch, personal pleasure that is maybe sexual or maybe not. So I just want to make sure I'm meeting everyone where they are. And my goal with the store is that all people are free to live in their pleasure. So we're really aiming for pleasure more than sex, though hopefully involving sex for those that's comfortable. Um, and also sort of hitting those um, social justice things that are so important, making sure that I'm paying attention to how there might be disparities and how people access pleasure, that I'm helping to address that um, through the business, through who I work with, and then making sure that the people I partner with are also aiming for those things, whether they themselves are, you know, BIPOC entrepreneurs or sex educators from different backgrounds. Um, and so it's just trying to create a really beautiful, holistic um, resource for people around sex and pleasure. That's great. Yeah. So this is fantastic. As a sex coach, I find myself all the time asked questions about like sex toys, um, finding pleasure, figuring out how to talk to our partners about pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I am one of the unusual sexuality educators. I am an ASEX certified sexuality, sexuality educator who doesn't focus on pleasure. I'm kind of a weirdo. Now that does not mean I'm, I'm not against it. I'm way for it, but it's just not my focus. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because I get out of the loop about like which toys are the mm. right moves and what's innovative right now. And also there's something that I take for granted. I think we both do is that we know how to walk into an erotic environment of all sorts of different oh. natures mm -hmm. very comfortably at this yeah. point. We've been doing it a long time. What I loved when you and I talked and we, we share something else, we both have come through, I see the Institute yes, for Sexuality, exactly. Education and Enlightenment, which is where we have both been trained. Um, it's not everybody gets to feel this comfortable in this kind of environment. So I would love for you to share with the audience how Earth and Salt <laughs> meets people. You said like yeah. meets people where they are. How do you do that? Right. Yeah. I try very hard to be very intentional about not making assumptions basically when people come into the store um, and also you know you can read someone's body language pretty easily but I don't want to let that limit me and how I approach them and I try really hard to let them guide you know they can tell me what they want they can tell me what their comfort level is um, so it's both you know being welcoming verbally but also with like the feel of the store. It was so important to me that the store feels really accessible and very welcoming. Um, you know, we verge on like the look of sort of a boutique type of thing, but that's done not uh, for the sense of luxury, but for the sense of comfort. Um, so that because people are used to basements, right? And I, all the time I hear from people like, oh, I'm not going to come because you must be in like, you know, a janky basement somewhere. And there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of posters, you know, where I am, there are some other stores and there's like, you know, um, marijuana head shops are part of the store, you know, and so it's part and parcel. And that's a very particular vibe. And I wanted to do something completely different. And so it's very bright, it's very clean, it's well organized. I have a lot of artwork in the in the store, and that was very important to me. I'm trying as hard as I can to reflect people's identities in the store through the artwork so that they can feel very welcome there through that as well. Um, and then, you know, the toy selection is part of it too. Uh, you know, it's making sure it's all body safe, making sure I've curated it, making sure I know what the businesses are, that they come from it. Um, and having that be in an accessible layout so that when someone comes in, they're not overwhelmed even by the amount of toys, that it feels easy to enter into just looking at the toys, touching the toys, getting information. 
Um, so just try and think through all the experiential elements of the toys in coming into a space like this. Okay. This is possibly one of the most accessible opportunities I have heard of in a long time, because you also have a, an option for people who don't live near Burlington, Vermont. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us how someone might feel getting in touch with Earth and Salt um, if they don't live nearby. Right. Yeah. So we, you know, we have an online store, which is pretty common, but I also try and make that really accessible. We um, very proudly have a section on our site that's like shop your values. So if you want to shop women made brands, BIPOC made brands, trans and envy owned, also Vermont made, because there's a lot of especially local kink makers, which is really exciting and fun. And, you know, I see that as part of the mission, supporting these businesses and getting their names out there as much as possible. So the online store is certainly one way. Uh, but we also have like some virtual workshops we offer. We have one, uh, you know, in the summer coming up on kind of lingus. I think we'll have one on the fall and sort of talking to your kids about sexuality at different ages as they go through. And then we also have our one-on-one -on -one appointments, which can be done virtually where basically I hang out in the store, you can book a time and you can come talk to me about whatever your concerns are, if you have concerns, or you can just sort of use me to shop. And we can talk through options and I can show you things live, let you hear how loud things are, let you see how large they are in my hands, you know, I have pretty normal hands, but it's always hard to tell online what you're really looking at. So that sounds like a lot of community support. You're really, I, really supporting the people who are um, around you and coming to you. That's awesome. Uh, intention, this, the intention. Yeah, this is, makes me excited because before yeah. I was in this particular scenario with this particular partner, um, I was with a person who was a bit more um, closed, a bit more shy about mm. this kind of environment and to have the opportunity to just do one-on-one, -on -one, like, okay, yeah. this isn't even, I'm going to go into a shop. And I always tell people like, go into your local shop. Don't be scared. The people right. who work there, they, they love this. They do it because they love it. They wouldn't choose to right. work here. They can work at target if they want to. And they, they, yeah. they choose this usually as, because it, they find some real meaning in it. So great. But also there can be a level of if not fear, just a sort of reticence to expose yourself to this and expose right. more importantly, I think what you like. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Right? Something you usually yeah. only share with people you're actually intending to engage with and not always even then. Not always even. Right. Oh, right. right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, this guy next to me had, it took years for well, him to tell me what he actually wanted out of a toy. Sure. Hearing you describe what your intention is for the store and your interaction with with people is um, it's it's so relaxing to my past self mm. who was I come from a background where no one ever talked about sex. Our sex education was a, a stack of Reader's Digest yeah. <laughs> books, the ones that were specific. It was to, the 70s. Oh, God, yeah. um, you know, the, the reproductive organs. Yeah. Right? Right. Because there was a also, um, you know, kidneys and spleens and stuff, but that was right. mixed in there and that was it. Yeah, that's it. So, that's not, that's not going to be good for the pleasure. Education. So at the point that I was like, right. I want a dildo, not, no way, not possible. Right. I could not even imagine. Plus. Putting myself out there just to find out how. <laughs> right. Plus you're a bi guy and you're out as yeah. bi. Yeah. But Ken was, he was into dildos way before he was acknowledging to himself let alone the world that he was by he was mm -hmm. into the idea of it yep. and he, into the the functionality of like oh what could i do with this and i remember the first That's a time very attractive shape right i remember the first time <laughs> it I doesn't you, mean anything at all yeah, i showed exactly. you one of mine and you were like i know exactly what i want to do with that but i i just imagine so many people having this this feeling that they can't ask anyone yeah. they can't mm -hmm. expose yeah, exactly. themselves Right. And you've created a place where they can not only shop online, because I know, yeah, sure, we can find toys places, but one, right. a curated selection yeah. of quality toys. And you mentioned something very important, bo it. body safe toys, yeah. because not all of them are. Right. Would you tell us more about what makes a toy body safe? Yeah, I mean, the there's the two most key things are material is the top one. So what is the toy made of? Um, in general, the safe options are silicone, glass, stainless steel, 
um, crystal to an extent, they have little micro fissions, so sometimes not, uh, porcelain, basically anything that doesn't have a porosity to it, because what happens is then they harbor bacteria. You can try and clean it, but you know, if you get like a jelly dildo, you don't put a condom over it and you use it, you will get a UTI or <laughs> something terrible. And you just don't want to go down that route at all. So knowing what the material is, pretty much every toy will tell you what it is, but they will also give you a whole lot of marketing nonsense around, like they can say they're body safe and they are not body safe. Like there is no um, federally regulated information or anything around sex toys in the US. So you ha really have to be careful of what the marketing is saying versus what is actual. And I see all sorts of things that are, you know, especially in lube, like organic, body safe, gonna make you feel amazing. And it's like, oh, but you have five different types of preservatives in here, which is gonna cause skin irritation for a large number of people. So a lot, I mean, a lot of my work is just vetting all of these things and trying to pay attention. But the other thing you wanna think too about is the base of the toy. So what's the handle? Is it gonna be the thing that you need for the activity you're doing? And especially in anal play, it's so important to have the flared base because uh, the anus is super strong and it will pull the toy into your body and yeah, give you a, a rough <laughs> evening. Yes, yes. And you know, that's just not what you're trying to do. So, yes. I mean, it's, it's uh, we do not need to add to the ER doctors. No. We don't need to I do know. that. Flared bases, yes. well, flared yes. bases. Under <laughs> all circumstances, there are zero exceptions to that rule. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. And you brought up lube. Mm -hmm. A fellow IC student, now um, an ASEC CSE, Ali Oseth, taught me a whole bunch about lubes. She had gone in and done some really interesting research about, mm -hmm. hey, uh, yeah, the FDA doesn't do anything around this, and we don't really know what's going on, and the testing situation is yeah. rough, to say the least, but could you make some general recommendations mm -hmm. about things we should look for or things we should stay away from? Yeah, so you want to stay away from glycol and glycerin because that basically can create yeast in the body um, and cause yeast infections, which is just really unfortunate. And I, I still see it all the time in lubes. It's amazing. Um, so that's one thing you want to keep an eye out for. The preservatives are another. Not everyone is sensitive to them, but enough people are. And I, you know, for me, I. I am always, you know, a little worried too about bringing things in that have like flavoring or essential oils because you know, I would hate to be the person who gave you something that I said was safe and then you develop like an allergic reaction to it. So there's a lot of times I say no to people because um, they want like the arousal gels that create stimulation through like cayenne or cinnamon and supposedly they're safe, but maybe they're not. And um, as someone who's had medical issues myself, which is partly how I came to build the business and just very aware that we don't really know what's in these products a lot of times. And as much as I can do to help people at least understand what it is and make good choices around it, I feel like I'm doing my job. Um, so yeah, keeping an eye on essential oils, you know, the more, the less ingredients, the better usually. Um, and then just keeping an eye out for those preservatives because they are in a lot. They're mostly in the water base. They're, you're not going to see them in the silicone um, and the hybrid ones as much. So if you're very sensitive to that, you can sort of look to these other options. Um, and you know, the oil-based ones are interesting because I've really gotten into them recently because they have such a wonderful tactile feel, mm -hmm. but you know, coconut oil can stay in the body so long that then that can also cause UTIs and similar mm -hmm. issues. So being aware of your own sensitivities to these certain issues is helpful. Yeah, this just came up on another episode that we were recording and I don't know which order they'll play in. So this will be interesting, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, so another sexuality professional was like, well, you know, I mean, you can grab olive oil or coconut oil. And I was like, I, I mean, Yes, to a degree. There right. are like, we, we all one have to know ourselves and two, I mean, there is a, there can be cleanliness factors as well. Yeah. Like, what are you taking this out of? What else has it been yeah. used for? Mm. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, yes. I have an oil-based lube that I love by Mr. Butters and I flip and love oh, it yeah. Works so well for my body. It's been revolutionary, but that's not going to be necessarily the case. So this is, this reminds me of when we were um, when you and I were looking for one, like we had to test it on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. We had to like, yeah. we bought some, we got some samples and we tried them out, not on our genitals. Yeah. <laughs> we tried yeah. them out in other places and it was an investment in time and a little bit of investment in some money that left us with a selection. Now we have like a range. We have five right. that we like, we know what to use them for. And that was a, that was a, a little exper experiment, probably like a couple months of playing with them. But now we have a little lube library and it's perfect. Yeah. 
I love it. You know, something special for anal play, yeah. something a little thicker, more viscous. Yeah. So, so good and worth it. And we're non-monogamous. So also we have to pay attention to like, well, what works for our other partners, yeah. mm-hmm. but right. what works right. for us as a couple and we're fluid bonded. So we don't necessarily use condoms. So then what happens when we're in other scenarios, we're in group scenarios. There's, mm-hmm. there's a lot to take into account. I'm yes. guessing that <laughs> wind up making a lot of recommendations based on people's various situations. Right. Right. And you know, one of the both fun and surprising things about the store is a lot of times people come in and then they're like, just give me your best thing. And I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, yeah. like you're going to have to give me some information about what you're aiming for. Do you have, you know, medical issues we need to pay attention to? What are your preferences? Which is fun. And like, that's where we get to have really interesting conversations, but people aren't always ready to be like, oh shit, I got to tell you things. Okay. <laughs> Right. You know. Things that they yeah. probably haven't told their doctors or right. their therapists, right? Like they're going to. Well, probably because they haven't been asked. <laughs> also probably because right. they haven't been asked. You're inviting the conversation. Yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. And it, but now I'm curious, why did you do this? Yeah. <laughs> why? Get there. Yeah. Why an adult store in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah. Um, it, in it a state I didn't live in. A beautiful place, but yes. it's like sort of tucked out of the way. It's not like you're in downtown Bay Area, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, so many things came together in one of those like perfect, perfect storm situations. So leading up to making the decision, I had gone through a multi-year health issue where I'd been like misdiagnosed. I could not get help. I was on wait list for, you know, months at a time doctors who wouldn't believe me, doctors who made me do treatments I didn't want to do to try and figure out what was going on. Um, And that left me feeling sort of very alone. It very much impacted my access to pleasure and sex um, in a way that really, you know, has changed me. I'm, you know, I'm still struggling with it years on. And between that and then opening up my relationship with my partner, um, going to a sex therapist and being like, oh, it's just going to be a couple months. I'm going to figure this out. This is going to be no problem. I got it. I know what the problem is. We're going to deal with it. You know, still doing it years on Um, those things happening at the same time, dissatisfaction with being in a corporate job, which I think a lot of people can appreciate, especially now Um, all of this sort of came together. And I was in in a trip in Burlington looking for a store to go to with my partner. And I saw there wasn't one. And I thought, oh, this would be the perfect place for this. Within three days, I said, oh, that's going to be me. I'm going to make that store Um, Mm. because I I wanted to make the resource I'd been looking for. You know, I I feel like there's such a very narrow view of what sexuality looks like in our culture. And it makes me nuts because it's just not how I work. And I'm glad for the people that it works for. But I just wanted to give a resource where people really could show up however they're feeling, if they have issues, if they're concerned, if they're like, super excited whatever it is you can still feel welcome there without being like oh like I'm not as good as this or I'm not as sexual as this which was the feeling I sort of felt with a lot of other stores yeah Hmm. that's the thing there's a right fit for different people and Hmm. many people feel held by our culture I mean that's why it exists right it feels it feels nurturing or nurturing enough it feels Hmm. safe enough and they're satisfied by that. And that's fine. It's, it's a little bit like monogamy in that way for me. I'm right. like, if monogamy works for you, awesome. You feel held or your religion, if your religion works for you and it just feels good, great. And then there's the rest of us. And that rest of us in all these different ways that I think about non-monogamy, kink, um, religious um, differences, philosophy differences, political differences, there's usually somewhere between five and 40% of us that are like, um, that doesn't work for me. Like in, across all these different intersections. And so we need service too. So I see you stepping up into that and in multiple ways, because something else that you did that I really respect is you decided to continue your education so that you would be really bringing not just a base level of information, but and evolving information because the field of sexuality is, well, it's growing fast. I mean, I, I'm always stunned by like, oh my God, there's more for me to know so much. How does your, your own self-education, your, your education path fit into running the store? 
I, it feels like the most important thing I, I could have done as I started this because everyone's experience is so unique and has so much to it. You know, I can't, I'm not talking to people just about sex. I'm talking to them about their life history. I'm talking to them about their relationships, their communication style, um, their health issues, you know, the environment they're in, the racism, whatever it might be that's impacting them. It's all there. And I think that was the thing that made me a little crazy about other places is it, sex feels very siloed in the culture. It's like the thing you go do and then you have the rest of your life. And it's just like, that's not how we actually operate. Um, so I just want to make sure that I was paying very close attention to that. And I needed a lot of education around that. Um, and as, as much as I can inform myself as this wide variety of topics, the better I can serve people when they come in and know what they're talking about. Um, you know, and I had, I had, uh, my staff person sort of say they want to help out with the one-on-one -on -one appointments, which is great. But I was like, you really got to get you a, a more baseline education because the issues people are coming with not only in the store, but especially to those one-on-one -on -one appointments tend to be just um, deeper and more complex and require a lot of knowledge. And, you know, I can only assume so much, which is I have to bring in more people to help. Um, but it just, I can't imagine, uh, you know, what I would be missing if I didn't, if right. I didn't have this education. You remind me of, I mean, I did a a webinar for IC on sex and kidney disease. And I did it. Yeah. Not, I'm not a medical professional, but my whole family has dealt with dialysis and, and kidney disease, everybody but me, basically. And so I had all of this specialized information. And that's, I think, what you're tapping into. It's normal to have a need for specialized information because you're a unique human. So great. Right. Ken has MS. Over the years, he's going to have different issues. And unique we need, ones for me, for you. And yeah. So we need to there. have that access to somebody who's willing to spend their life. I, Cause I'm hearing like a life's work, like you're never oh, going to yeah. be done. I know. No. And I have to remind myself of that all the time when I'm start being like, I don't know enough. And then it's like, yeah, no one does. It's okay. <laughs> like oh, You're trying, <laughs> you're trying and just being open. I think meeting people where they are is, is yeah. a brilliant start. And then being willing to dive in and explore like problem solving, so that leads me to wonder, so what would be a good first question for someone? Mm, like, yeah. how do you, mm, like, let's just imagine, question. I'm thinking about couples that have come to me and they're, they, they don't even know where to begin. Like we're, right. we're talking about pleasure. Okay. Now that's the hugest topic possible. Where might they start? What's a, right. a good question or, cause right. often I think we jump to like, what's a good toy, but yes. I'm sure it's more backed out than that. Yeah, I, it is best case scenario. It is, it's good to, you know, back out from there. And I, you know, I think the thing I was listening to one of your other podcasts and it was all about the incremental improvement, right? Um, and I think that's the best approach is sort of to say, okay, we're taking a pretty honest look at our current scenario. These are the things that are limiting us. And, you know, looking at um, like Emily Nagoski's stressors uh, or the brakes and the accelerators, right? The dual control model. Yeah. What's your accelerator? What is the accelerator that we can sort of help allow to come to the front? And does that require a toy? Does that require like a sex wedge to make sure that your back is in a better position so you don't have back pain and you're more excited then to get into sex? Is it a book where you get to learn about consensual non-monogamy, you know, and get some basic info so you can have the conversations you want to have? Um, so basically, yeah, what's going to be that thing that gives you a little bit more depth into the pleasure you're looking to have in the way you're looking to have it? What is What might be that thing? Yeah. So really letting it be an open-ended conversation so that it's not uh, too targeted too fast. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, and that's what people come in and they sort of want to go, I just need a toy. That's just going to like get me off in five minutes. And I'm like, I mean, we can do that. <laughs> you know, we could definitely do that, but you know, what else might there be that's driving this? Oh, you have three kids at home. You have very little time and you know, you have almost no privacy with your partner. Well, what might we be able to do around that? Well, how are your locks on your doors? You right. Know, like right. things like that. And how are you talking about sex in your household? Because no. if you normalize it, then yeah, your, your 12 year old can be in the other room and you can have told them, yep, we're going to have private time. It like, right. we normalized that. So it became very easy for us to have sex, even though we had a house, with seven children in it, because right. we could just say, this is private time, grown up time. We're not available mm -hmm. right now. And we had that option, but we, it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't known to create a sex positive atmosphere. Right. 
Yeah. And the thing is, you talked about sex being siloed and it so much is because the same thing happens when I have to mow the lawn. Right. Hey, you're going to have to deal with yourself <laughs> for a while because I got to go do this thing. Right. But we set this aside as though it should be deprioritized in some way and right. hidden. Like it's selfish. Like it's selfish. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I, I just so. celebrate your willingness to have conversations with people to help them get past all of that. Yeah. There's also a lot of kinds of ways people want to get off. Mm. So, oh, God, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> every kind. Every, every kind, kind, right? And <laughs> I'm a fan of saying, like, I mean, you can have sex with the, like, it can be a, a very low cost investment, it can be a very expensive investment. I'm kinky. I have made some investments over the years in pieces, in actual material objects that I love. I mean, that can be a real thing. I'm curious about uh, what do you see people coming in to the store? Like, what are they, what are they looking for? If they're, if they're at that edge and they're like, Ooh, maybe I want something a little edgier. Maybe Mm -hmm. I'm ready to invest in my pleasure. What might they be looking for? Uh, the things that usually come up are like interesting couples toys. The thing that I get the most questions about are especially hands-free toys, which are becoming more and more popular and the technology around them is getting much more nuanced and interesting. Um, that's probably the biggest thing I get questions about. I am still building out our sort of, um, kink welcoming space. We have a number of items, but it's not, it doesn't feel like a whole kink section. Right. So I don't think I've quite caught the audience. That's like, I want a, you know, a big cross in my bedroom. How do you help me <laughs> find this? Yeah. Like, I know people, right? Um, so on the kink side of things, I haven't seen as much then, but I also have a lot of like relatively inexpensive items. Like leather tends to be one of the more expensive items. Um, but, you know, you can easily get a really nice vegan leather at this point. And like, this is where my local makers come in. You know, they can do amazing things at actually very reasonable cost. Right. Um, But, you know, it's the buying trends that I see are some people, the primary things are like people come in and they just want beginner's toy, something interesting. Tell me about that. Or a lot of times there's a couple who comes in and they're like, we have $300 to spend. I need this, 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 you know, like they want a harness, they want a dildo, they want the nice lube and like, I don't know, some nipple clamps or something, right? Like it's like basically a full outfit. You could think of it that way, you know, so getting it's nice to get a toy, but sometimes when you just get like the full thing and you're creating like a full body experience for yourself, it's, it's a very different experience. And people, people get very excited about that. So something I recommend to clients, and I'm guessing this, that you, you would be a a good spot for this is to treat a, a, a trip to a store like yours, Mm -hmm. whether that's virtual or in person as a date. Yeah. And one of the things I, I invite them to do is consider whether this is a date that you're specifically planning together, or if one of you wants to take a more dominant role, like that can be a really right. baseline way to just play with like, what's it like to be in right. charge and to be selecting. And, um, it's been really exciting for some of the couples I've worked with who are, they're not really into any sort of formal power play. Mm-hmm. They do want to play at the edges of what it's like to have someone take erotic care of them. And I'm just thinking that a store like yours is a good place to, to play with that because mm-hmm. it's just energy, really. It's, yeah. can I show up and feel like my partner can, can talk to this person and can make selection, can ask based on what they know of me and what I might like, can, they, can we have this conversation? Because the, the conversation itself is erotic. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that, that's where people wonder, will I be, will I be harmful to the store? Like it, like the store Mm. itself might be a turn on to me. Will, will that be bad? Is that a bad thing to do? But Mm. we both learned from Raz DeShavo and I'm guessing you heard this at some point too. When you're teaching, sometimes there's erotic energy in the room. You're teaching about sex and that's fine. As long as everybody keeps that erotic energy to themselves. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) It's, It's yours to have. Right. So if you're worried right now, if you're listening and you're worried that, um, that you might be turned on, this is an opportunity to learn about consent and how it works. Just, yeah, yeah, you get to be turned on and you get to keep that to yourself and have the experience. And if you have anything to say or push back against that, I'm, I'm happy to hear it, but I've heard this worry before. Yeah, I honestly, it's, it's not even something I really think about in part because I think a lot of the people who come in 
um I don't know I mean we're not a late night shop you know people aren't coming in around midnight or anything yeah. we're not near bars and so there's not like the alcohol component and the loosening that that comes with that um so I think most people come in we're just like in a really good happy headspace and I think because also of the environment of the store it feels like a place just to feel good you know and if people are getting off on it, I'm honestly not even aware of it. It's like it hasn't seemed very apparent. Um, mostly, you know, I'll hear like giggling or if there's people who stay in the shop for a while, like it's just a wonderful thing to see. Um, and so I just feel happy for people, you know, I'm glad they're there. That makes me happy too. That's great. So what's it at the, at the baseline now, let's just do a little physiology before yeah. we, before we wrap up at the, you've got all these bodies, right? And we, we do know gender's not, <laughs> gender's not a binary, really nothing's a binary and right. bodies are complex. So given the fact that everybody's body is different and everybody's pleasure centers are going to operate differently and everybody's trauma history is different mm-hmm. and everybody, all of that, what's a good way to start the conversation with your partner what would you recommend people do if they're like, okay, now we've heard you, what do we do now? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think oh, it's so unique and how you're going to approach your partner. Um, I'm hoping, you know, this is where like having developed really good communication skills comes in so handy. You know, do you have the ability to create a space to have this conversation? It, having it outside of the bedroom, at least to start is usually very helpful, you know, um, lessen the potential stress of it. I think too, I I can't remember if we talked about this concept, but I talk about it to everyone. So probably, Um, but like just talking about talking, um, this was introduced to me by a therapist of just like, you know, you don't have to talk about the subject, talk about having the conversation say, you know what, I would like to have a conversation with you about changing something and how we're having sex. It's very exciting for me. And I would like to bring that to you. How's next Tuesday at six, you know? And you can help de-escalate them. They can think about it. They can maybe start asking you a little questions before that Tuesday time. Um, and so people can come together to talk about this in a much more open headspace. And I think also bringing it to them as what your interests are, what you're hoping to get out of it, emphasizing your desires, your hopes for pleasure, um, how this is just going to help you. Because I think people are afraid of the lack aspect of it, that you're trying to fix something or replace something. And if you can attend to that through your initial conversation, that's going to really help uh, deescalate those stressors too around that. So being aware, being conscious, being, um, you know, as caring as you can be to your partner, understand that they might have, you know, a discomfortable uh, reaction to it at first, but, you know, to go along with that, you can also propose, um, you know, a willingness window. Say, I would just like to try it for like five minutes the next time we have sex, would that be okay? And then we can talk about it afterwards. You know, very low stakes, hopefully for people. I like that suggestion. That's a good one. When, um, When we talk, to each other about new things because there are still new things don't oh, worry you're not going to run out yes. um, we've no. been at this a while you're not going to run out um, yeah. when we talk about new things that what you just mentioned about there there being the, the concern that someone might perceive an interest in something new as a lack mm-hmm. like now mm-hmm. does this mean that something's missing or i'm not good enough um and i hear that come up a lot with cisgender men yeah in particular um, some real concerns and actually in both directions, both they're, they're sharing that they want something else more new, different, and also receiving that, that information. And I think that that speaks to a little bit of the, the way that guys in like a really general sense are socialized and how yes, they have been. Absolutely. What would you say to somebody who's really nervous mm-hmm. about this, this aspect, this, this perceived lack Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, as with everything, it's one of those things that you sort of have to investigate for yourself, right? Where is it coming from? What is that thing? How can you attend to it outside of maybe this initial situation, right? Like if it's a perceived lack in your own physical ability, can you have that conversation with your partner? Can you have that conversation with yourself? Or is there something you could do for yourself that's not in this proposal that would make you feel the way you want to feel, right? Like this doesn't have to be a one-way street. You, you know, it's not just like your partner is going to use a sex toy and you are over here, you know, <laughs> like this can be a mutual thing. Hopefully them bringing you something can allow you to say, 
oh, you know what, actually, I've also been thinking about this thing, I never brought it to you, or, you know, I have this concern, I just want to hear from you, does this feel right to you, how do I, you know, sort of appear to you, because, you know, I, I think getting lost in ourselves is the thing that really hurts us a lot of times, and not bringing that um, honesty to people, and just having it weigh on us can be so tough, um, and hopefully if you're in a loving partnership, it's going to be met really well. Yeah, I, that makes me think about, um, envy and jealousy. And, you know, people ask me all the time, if you can be like jealous of a sex toy, (laughs) because my research is in jealousy. And I'm like, well, uh, sort of the answer is kind of because jealousy is a triangular problem that involves losing the, the, your connection to your beloved, your fear of that loss. Now you're not going to lose the connection to your beloved, to a dildo because they're an inanimate object. However, the imagination can run away with things. And an imaginal fear is just as real for your psyche as any real human. So when we're dealing with somebody who's nervous about lack, that's where I go is like, how do we keep your imagination from running away with you? How do we, how do we help you deescalate that for yourself and your partner? And the simplest way I know is to ask for reassurance. It's, um, it's so simple and remarkably it feels like a cheat somehow. Right, um, right. <laughs> right. It's just asking. Code. That's all Ask I got to do. Insurance. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So if you're afraid, so I, I, I could use us as an example. If, if you are wanting access to a phallic shape and you're not seeing somebody who happens to have one in their pants and you want me to play that with you, but you, you're afraid that I might have feelings about being not enough or right. whatever, right? So if I'm going to wear a strap on or whatever, great. It is totally cool with me if you just say, I'm going to ask you for something. And before I ask you, I'm going to ask you for another thing. I'm going to ask you to be calm and reassuring because I'm really nervous about how this is going to go. So frequently, I find we forget that we can ask people for the response that we want. We, we get to They're like, I need a cheerleader about this. Will yeah. you be my cheerleader? Yeah. Yeah. You get to have t- toy cheerleaders. Right. Right. And now I, now I want more of that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, that is my job. I have to change my title on my business card. Toy cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as we're wrapping up, do you have, do you have some favorites these oh days? My God. Yes. And I wish I had them in front of me because now I'm going to have to remember from memory. And I just like sta- scan the entire sc- store. Um, the one, the best seller in the store is one called the Dame Palm. So it fits in the shape of your palm. It's a flexible body and it's got rumbly vibrations, which mean the vibrations are penetrating the skin tissue further. So you're getting more of a stimulating sensation. Mm-hmm. It's such a nice toy. It's great for vulva owners. It's great between bodies, vulva owners and their partners. You can grind against it. It's just the variety you can get out of it is amazing. Um, So that I'm always a cheerleader for, for sure. And like, I'm one of the biggest cheerleaders for sex wedges. Like, I just want everyone to have a sex wedge. They're so useful. They're so useful. Like basically, yeah, yeah. So it's basically, it's purpose-made. So you, I can imagine most people have probably had the experience of trying to prop themselves up with normal pillows, which compress when you are on top of them and you add body weight, they move around. They are unreliable. They're not going to be good partners with you in your sexual experiences. But the sex wedge is heavier. It's compressed foam. Um, so it holds its shape. It holds where it is. And especially if you have like a memory foam mattress, it gives you a flatter, more stable surface because I don't know about you. If you've tried the memory foam mattress, you just sink right into it and you have no leverage, yeah, um, which I love is really my cast challenging. Mattress, but that is 100% how it is. I'm like, how do I get a good pounding here? How, yeah. how, how am I going really get- tough? It's it also it's hilarious. Like, it's not well, it's not- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. So that's <laughs> more sex. More sex. I'm just on yes. a marshmallow. What I need is a good pounding and I'm going to get some chocolate to go with this marshmallow. Right. right. So, yeah. Right. And it's funny. I we're, we're between houses right now as we renovate mm-hmm. and um, yeah, my sex wedges are all packed away oh. and I'm noticing. I'm so sure. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to be team sex wedge for, for sure. It's because amazing. I didn't even realize Right. Sure. It's a simple object that can make, and it makes an accessibility difference. So as, as our mobility changes through illness or just aging or whatever, it also just, it just makes things 
comfortable Can again. It's not even about yeah. possible. What our 20 year old said when we were packing the pod. Oh God. So we, we packed up our sex wedges and the kids <laughs> <first> saw <laughs> them like go by. Yeah. yeah. What What's say? that for? Mm. I said, it's for, um, it's for positioning. And, uh, our 17 year old said, you mean like yoga? Could be, could be like yoga. <laughs> like yoga. I didn't want to get into but, it. They didn't want know, me to get into yeah. it. But, More. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. With penetration or not. Yeah. And the thing is, it's one of those situations where I think they know what it is. And they're just seeing if I'm going to say it. If you'll say <laughs> yeah, it, right? They, do, they like to push him a little bit. They did no sure. I'll say it all. They, they yes. know. Right, right. <laughs> Never ask mom a question you don't want the answer to, ever. That's reasonable. Yes. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't entirely gotten away from my nobody ever talks about sex upbringing. Still growing up. Yeah. 55, still growing up. Yes, as was many of us. Right. So, Beth, tell people how they can find you, how they can find Earth and Salt. How can they get in touch? Yeah, so our website's a great place to start. It's earthandsaltshop.com. There you can get to the online store. You can book one-on-one appointments. Um, You can also just sort of see what we're featuring, our events, everything. And I think the best thing is honestly joining our newsletter. So that's how you're going to find out about products. That's how you're going to find out about our events, uh, sales. Anything that we're doing will go through the newsletter. So that's the best. Um, Certainly, you can also follow us on Instagram, also earthandsaltshop. Instagram is not a friendly place, unfortunately, to this type of topic. So I would say newsletter, definitely Instagram. We have fun there and there's a lot I can do with it. But um, whether the information reaches you or not is not always in my hands. Uh, So that's not as not as easy of a connection. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully join the newsletter and that would be wonderful. Get on Beth's newsletter. Get on Earth. It's it just we all need a little dose of erotic energy in our life. Right. Like from time to time. And. I actually, I, I'm on lots of newsletters for exactly that, to remind me of my own needs. So I'm not always giving, but I'm also receiving and your work really speaks to me. I'm so thrilled to have had you on the show and can't wait to come up and check out. Yeah, (laughs) that would be wonderful. Even though I just, uh, you know, I just outed myself as not being very good at talking about sex, which is a shame. (laughs) I, I, we need more of these conversations, the newsletters to bring, to bring sex out of that silo into places where we can talk about it in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm very, very happy that that's the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Yes, I appreciate it. Thanks Mm -hmm. for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I have one more thing to share with you. If you want to pop over to listentojolie.com, that's just listen to Jolie, J-O-L-I.com, you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Yeah, get the guides. They're easy to implement conversations that will empower you to create the love you want. It's my mission to make everything talk aboutable. Sex, love, losses and learns. Everything is talk aboutable. She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my lovers, my friends, my family, and you all on a podcast out loud. Relationship work really can change everything. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way you'd hoped, remember relationships can be messy and that's good news.